Hello everyone, uh, I would like to start by welcoming you all, thank you for joining us uh, for today's research seminar, which is, uh, I believe, very time landover. My name is Bahadur Dinchel, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the research project Striking from the Margins. And our guest speaker for today is a very distinguished young scholar on the topic uh, at hand, Dr. Toby uh, Mathison. Dr. Mathison is a senior research fellow in the International Relations of Middle East at the Middle East Center of St. Antonio's College, Oxford, University of Oxford. He was previously a research fellow at various uh, universities, including Cambridge and LSE, and holding a PhD from SOAS. Uh, and he's a very uh, productive scholar, and he has published widely in various academic journals, and in particular, he is the author of two recent books. One was published by Cambridge University Press, and one was published by uh, Stanford University Press. And his current research and academic interests, in the broadest sense, uh, revolve around Sunni Shia relations in the Middle East, which is a very important topic, subject, and crucial to grasping the complex dynamics of the Middle East, and as far as I understand, he is currently drafting another book on the topic, and we are looking forward to uh, reading it, it as well. The topic of today is uh, Saudi Arabia and Shiism is a quite timely and interesting topic. Timely because of the latest political developments, not only in Saudi Arabia, but also throughout the entire region and of course across the world, indeed. The increasing tension between Saudi, uh, Iran and the United States is also worth to mention here. I mean, it would be meaningless to claim that there will be no repercussions on Saudi Arabia's local and regional reading uh, due to the increasing tension between the US and, and Iran. The topic of today is interesting. Uh, interesting because we have been witnessing local, regional and international political developments regarding Saudi Arabia with a particular reference to its ideological stance in, a, in an unprecedented scale. And indeed, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince, Prince of Saudi Arabia, has recently been quite active, politically active, and not a day goes without uh, hearing a statement or a news about a reform or a political change in Saudi Arabia. So, traditionally affiliated with extremist ideologies, I mean, particularly at acting at the, at the extreme uh, end of the religious spectrum, and often affiliated with unreasonable, unconstructive, and outspoken approaches to religion and politics, it seems that al Saud family, I mean, with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, <clears throat> has been trying to expand its sphere of influence inside the country and across the region in an unprecedented fashion. That is naturally creating many questions, worries, and hopes at the same time. Here the question is, to what extent is being affiliated with extremist ideologies is something that could change. Uh, I'm sure after Dr. Madison's presentation, we will have a more structured, more nuanced and clear understanding of the situation and we will feel much more equipped to answer to that particular question. So, uh, Dr. Madison, thank you for being us with today and uh, the floor is all yours, please. Uh, you have 40, 45 minutes and then we will have a question. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, and thank you very much to uh, Harith Al Qarawi and Christo Mateus for making this all uh, happen. Um, it's been very, very nice to arrive here in Budapest. Uh, the subject of today's talk is potentially vast. And as you will note, it tends to compare two things of different categories, right? One, a state, Saudi Arabia, and on the other hand, a particular interpretation of Islam a confession, Shiism. Now, why would one want to do this? Um, I think because in Saudi Arabia, a particular interpretation of Sunni Islam gained in prominence in the last centuries that, while denouncing most Muslims, took particular aim at Sufis and Shis. And the legacies of those ideas have become a defining feature in Sunni-Shi relations. And these ideas have often received backing by the Saudi state. They have also played a role in relations between Saudi Arabia and states with Shia populations, in particular Iraq and Iran, the two most important examples. As such, this talk will focus on the development of these ideas, the ideas of the Wahhabiyya inside Saudi Arabia, their impact on Sunni-Shia relations, and the concrete implications for the Shia communities of the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, as well as southern Iraq. 
Apart from my own work, this talk will largely draw on the work of Guido Steinberg as well as Rehan Ismail, who've uh, written quite extensively um, about um, this. And I will go in quite some historical detail, but don't worry, at the end we'll come back to the more present period and talk about some of the things that um, uh, were just raised. So, in the first half of the 18th century, a boy by the name of Muhammad was born in a small town in the Central Arabian region of Najd into a family of religious scholars. Following the family tradition, he set out as a young man to travel and study. He first went to Medina to the west, where he studied uh, with a number of scholars, in particular one Indian scholar who uh, emphasized the importance of being certain about what really happened during the Prophet's time and what exactly the Prophet said, so the importance of Hadith. He then went to the eastern oasis of Al-Aqsa and finally to Basra, the southern Iraqi port town. On these travels, he came into contact with Muslims from different confessions and um, you know, interpretations, for example with Sufis that performed a wide range of religious practices. It was on these sojourns that the essence of his ideology crystallized itself. And it must have been in some of those years, and these travels lasted for a few years, that he switched and, and started to become very convinced that um, the way he saw things was the way forward. Um, it's actually debated in the literature what actually happened. No one really knows. In Basra, a town with many Shia inhabitants, he was eventually expelled for preaching against the religious practice of the locals. And um, it was most likely there and in Al-Aqsa that he also came in contact with Shis and was uh, 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 observing some of their religious rituals. Upon, upon returning to Najd, he published a treatise outlining his, outlining his views and started preaching and gaining followers to his cause. Central to his call was the idea of unity of God, Tawhid, and the sense that any religious practice that could be seen as elevating other people to godlike status should be denounced and abolished. One of his main legacies was the idea that people who performed such religious acts, but in effect everyone who opposed his and his followers' call, was committing an act of disbelief, kufr, and could thus be excommunicated, takfir. This meant that those people, even if they were devout Muslims, or thought of themselves as devout Muslims, would lose their protections as Muslims under Islamic law, and the most extreme measures against them were thus justified. In other words, it was legitimate to kill them and take their pro property if they refused to join the call. While his ideas found some resonance in Najd, they were also immediately rejected by many, in fact by most uh, scholars of the time, and even by his own family. Um, but Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, the name of the young boy, who now grew up to be a, a man, was able to seal an alliance with a provincial ruling family, the Al Saud. This alliance gave ideological cohesion to the political project of the Al Saud family, and military muscle to the so-called Wahhabi missionary project. And it's important to emphasize that Wahhabis themselves do not like to be called Wahhabis because it's, uh, it uh, signifies being followers of a particular person, which is exactly what they reject. They call themselves Muwahidun, um, uh, but uh, for the you know, sake of clarity and, and just because the term has become uh, standard in the literature and public discourse, I will use it. Um, and to implement their project, the Wahhabis wanted to conquer, of course, the holy places of Islam, Mecca and Medina, in the Hejaz to the west, which were at that time under the control of the Sharifs of Mecca and their patrons, the Ottoman Empire. The Wahhabi movement was thus also a re rebellion against the state Islam of the Ottoman Empire, which did allow for substantial autonomy and religious activities of non-Sunni Sunni communities, and which in part was also based on, on, on an alliance with Sufi orders. The Wahhabi movement in particular sought to abolish the visitation of graves and holy sites, and thus Sufism and Shiism, in which this is a very important part of popular religiosity, were singled out as particularly heretical. In his writings on the Shia, Ibn Abdul Wahhab made frequent reference to an earlier 
scholar from the Hanbali tradition, the Hanbali school being one of the four main schools of law uh, of Islam. And that earliest scholar was Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah was a Hanbali reformer whose influence in particular as a sort of godfather for the Wahhabi Salafi tradition can hardly be overstated. He was influential for the general outlook of the Salafi movement. But because of his harsh stances on the Shia and also on a particular subsect um, of Shiism, the Alawites um, in Syria, is of particular relevance for the history of Sunni Shia relations. Ibn Taymiyyah, like the founder of that whole Hanbali school, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, in the 8th and 9th century, was particularly interested in hadith. So, the sayings and, and, and the deeds um, of the Prophet. As an early traditionist, Ibn Hanbal sought to establish a canon of authoritative hadith in order to best reflect the Prophet's sayings and deeds, so that later generations of Muslims could live according to this tradition and be certain about what the right practice um, uh, would be. They espoused a literal reading of the Quran and of the Hadith, and any practice that could not be traced to the pious ancestors was considered an innovation and was to be rejected. For Ahmad ibn Hanbal and subsequent scholars of his school, the Shia view on the companions and thus on the authenticity of the Hadith was deeply troubling and impossible to reconcile with their quest for certainty around the Prophet's uh, traditions. And um, I suppose I need to explain this quickly. Um, there's obviously a great deal of um, disagreement about the early period, and, and she is generally reject some of the earlier, um, uh, some of the companions of the Prophet and some of the followers of the Prophet, and that has serious repercussions about on the Hadith, which is, um, uh, I mean, again, this is a too vast topic, but it's very important because it is from here that this later kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, division uh, uh, stems. And so in the words of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, in his short treatise on Shiism, um, he says, this criticism of the companions of the Prophet is, the, and I quote, is the destruction of the basis of religion because its base is the Quran and the Hadith. So the disagreement here is really about the fundamentals um, of the religion. Given the practice of takfir and the aggressive military measures that the Saudi Wahhabi movement adopted from early on, the movement would encounter many enemies, as I've previously mentioned, and numerous treatises denouncing them were published. I mean, they were written, obviously not published at that time. I'm sorry. Um, publishing em emerged a century later um, in, the, in the Islamic world for, for a religious text. Given the fierce anti-Shia polemics and actions of the Wahhabis, Shia scholars in particular would publish um, against the Wahhabis. This tension between the Wahhabis and, and Shis increased after the death of, of Ibn Abdul Wahhab in the late um, uh, 18th century. Because it was only after his death that the Wahhabi movement faced the question about what to do with actual governing um, uh, uh, Shia populations. A question that had not posed itself before because they were confined um, to, to central um, uh, uh, Arabia. Some of his sons and other uh, disciples further refined his doctrinal views, and one of his sons wrote a particularly vicious and detailed anti Shia tract that forms the basis for a lot of later polemics. The most extreme views that the Shia are infidels that can be killed and at most should be converted or expelled from the realm have been held by Wahhabi clerics for a long time. When Ibn Abdul Wahhab's followers moved into Eastern Arabia and Iraq, then under Ottoman control, they aimed to put these ideas into practice. Um, in a sense, trying to force the local Shi'is to either convert or at least just um, uh, don't perform their religious acts uh, in public. But inside Saudi Arabia, and now we're moving on to the 20th century already, a compromise had to be found, in particular with regards to the Shia of, um, of Katif and Al-Aqsa, and you see this here, um, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, the eastern province uh, uh, here, um, uh, uh, with, with large Shia populations. And um, southern Iraq, we would obviously be talking about uh, uh, this region. 
In 1802, they, I mean the Saudi Wahhabi forces, raided the shrine city of Karbala in Iraq, um, holy to Shia Muslims because um, uh, uh, Hussein uh, is buried there, destroying and looting the city and killing uh, many. They also laid siege to the other Shia shrine city of Iraq, Najaf, where um, uh, Ali uh, uh, is, is buried, um, according to, to Shia beliefs. Um, but were initially unsuccessful. But in subsequent raids in coming years, they also managed to, to ransack um, uh, Najaf. And so the raiding of the two um, uh, places that are most important to Shia after, the, after um, Mecca, Medina and Jerusalem by the Wahhabi movement um, left a, a historical memory of, of, of severe animosity that um, uh, has been um, uh, instrumentalized uh, ever since. So, um, for example, when um, IS threatened to also um, uh, uh, attack those shrines and blow them up, the memory of the Wahhabis uh, uh, attacking these shrines was invoked as a way to mobilize young Shia to, to go and fight um, uh, against um, IS. And this is often referred to in polemics about the Wahhabis as one of their big crimes, with the other um, big um, crime that is um, uh, uh, in invoked by Shias being the destruction of, of uh, several um, historical buildings in, in the Hijaz in Mecca and Medina when they conquered um, that in, in 1925. Um, this were particular domes erected over the graves of what the Shia consider imams and, and some other buildings associated with with graves uh, uh, in particular. Um, uh, and um, while there was a certain outcry across the Islamic world, um, the, the, um, the, the, the Saudi Wahhabi uh, polity and, and the emerging Saudi state also gained much legitimacy um, when they conquered uh, uh, the Hijaz because control over Mecca and Medina were historically very important for, for Muslim rulers and um, was uh, usually seen as a prerequisite to, to being a caliph and you had to control Mecca and Medina, um, uh, or, or that was generally um, um, uh, uh, seen. And they conquered both the eastern province and the Hijaz from the Ottomans, something I want to come back to, come back to later. And um, just um, to quickly come back to... Um, um, oh. oh, I've gone too enthusiastically on this... Uh, on this uh, um, oh. Well, I was also told I can uh, use my two fingers to swipe. Right. <laughs> well, I don't know. Okay, I wanted to show you this. So, uh, the views of the Wahhabi clerics on the Shia are kind of most um, concisely um, written down in, in a fatwa of 1927, um, which was pronounced at a, at a meeting of, of clerics and, and the tribal militia of uh, Ibn Saud, King Abdulaziz, the founder of the, first, of, of the, of the, Saudi, of the modern Saudi state, um, in which they, um, they kind of put the, the most extreme demands, in a sense, or, or what, what had been their demands for a long time in writing and addressed it uh, to the ruler. And um, I'm not going to, I mean, you can read it yourself, right? In any case, um, as you see, this, this uh, very famous uh, fatwa says that the Shia have to either convert or leave or, or they have to really be basically converted to, to be proper Muslims. Um, and also that they should obviously stop going to Najaf and Karbala and, and it also talks about the Shias of, of Iraq. Now, um, this leads us to, I suppose, the second theme of the, of the talk. 
which is what's the relationship between religion and politics and what's the relationship between the Wahhabia and the Saudi state and that's something that you know in the introduction was briefly mentioned and is now quite frequently discussed in the news and has been in the scholarship on Saudi Arabia really one of the, the main kind of debates you know what is actually going on was were the Wahhabi you know were, were these ideas driving the you know this this political entity to do all of these things, or were the, were the ruling family um, instrumentalizing religion? And um, you know, in the literature, it's not really resolved. Although there's a slight tendency to say that what well, politics trumps ideas, or politics trumps um, religion. But um, this uh, particular fatwa is is interesting because in response to this, um, King Abdulaziz actually thought, well, this is really going too far. And he cracked down on on this tribal militia that was trying to, you know, carry out this 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 um, in this fatwa, particularly in the eastern province, because he thought this is a challenge to his authority. And so he he killed the leaders or exiled them and and settled this this tribal militia in kind of new agricultural settlements. Um, and so basically broke the backbone of of the kind of I mean it was his own army. With this army he had conquered the whole you know whole of Saudi Arabia, but. When a few years later they say, "Well, okay, now we conquered the whole territory for you. Now please do what what we want to do. You know what we had kind of agreed to initially." Um, he he wavered, and um, so this instance is is quite important um, uh, because when it comes to the Shia, um, there was apparently an agreement in 1913 when when King Abdulaziz conquered the eastern province that um, the Shia would be allowed to you know to to, to keep their particular um, you know, to stay Shia, but they should not uh, perform their, their rituals in public, and he would protect them. So the state would protect them from, from, from these kind of um, 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 uh, uh, demands. And that is something that recently has uh, uh, come up again. I mean, uh, on the one hand, the ruling family is trying to, and has actually for the past century, always tried to portray itself as a defender of... Um, of different religious groups uh, in the kingdom, but on the other hand, of course, um, uh, the, the state's policies have been often, you know, quite distinctively um, uh, anti-Shia. Just with, with these being the most extreme demands, you know, uh, you, I mean, it was they could find a middle ground whereby um, uh, the Shia would be kind of marginalized, but not not to to that extent. And so in a recent interview, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, stated, and now let's see if we can go back to that without... Uh, here. Stated that there were both Sunnis and Shi'is in Saudi Arabia, so we believe that we, have a, that we are a mix of Muslim schools and sects. Uh, this statement is true, of course, for the Arabian Peninsula and Saudi Arabia in particular is home to a range of different uh, Muslim de denominations to all four Sunni schools of law, as well as Sufis, Twelve Shi'is, Ismailis and uh, even some Saidis. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, the, the strong legacy of anti-Shiism that was built into the state ideology and that was then also implemented uh, uh, in, in, in many cases, um, really leaves one to wonder, you know, um, what is actually going on. And um, so in this, um, you know, this is now a very famous uh, uh, section that has been um, uh, quoted uh, uh, quite a lot. And um, in this, uh, up here, you know, he, he says that well, yes, we do have Shi'is. And then he says, It is clear that our laws are coming from Islam and the Quran, but we have all the four schools. And they argue about interpretation. So, what does that... Yes? That's Sunni schools, not yeah. Shia schools. Yes. So what does that imply? That he's not, Shia in, not in a Wahhabi anymore, because they, were, they overcame before. <laughs> that is also true, of course, yes. That is, that is true. 
that is one thing. I mean, that's the most so, important thing in my view. <laughs> that is a very important thing. It is true. So it is very important that he even mentions the the four schools because until a few years ago, all the clerics that that sat on the official uh, uh, clerical boards and, and and issued the laws and the fatwas of the kingdom were only from the Hanbali school and were generally Wahhabi clerics. And he should have said Jafariya for the Shiites. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so that is one thing. But so that. That is a change in the sense that he mentions the four schools. But so what? What, are, what is what is implied? Obviously, he's just like uh, getting away from this Wahhabi identity by saying that also in Saudi Arabia there is like diversity of Sunni schools, and that implies also for Shiism. That is. I mean, in general, that, I think that's what he wants to say. But so, what can we read out of this? The first, uh, the first line. I think it was already mentioned, kind of. Not recognizing the Shia. Is yeah, that? yeah. So, the Shia. I mean, so all the four schools. Yeah, they argue about interpretation. So, a, a demand by the by the Shia clerics and kind of in the in the international. I mean, in the 20th century, in the mid-20th century, there were very serious efforts at trying to bring uh, the different, you know confessions in Islam together, between the Azhar, the Najaf Hausa, and Iran. And uh, one of the main things was that, you know, all the states should recognize at least uh, Shiism and Zaydism um, uh, as, as kind of, you know, accept also valid schools of, of law, you know, through which you can come at, at legal judgments and that you can, you know, you have, you know, judges that, that I mean, it's just accepted. So Saudi Arabia never accepted that, and it's been one of the main demands of, let's say, the Shia opposition and and in and, and broader dialogues. Um, uh, you know, it, it's been one of the main things. And um, in this, you know, he says, "Well, there are Shia, <laughs> but of course, we don't accept um, we don't accept the way they come at, at at particular rulings." And so, for me, on the one hand, this is a this is an improvement in terms of the other four schools, um, but on the Shia question, it's a very clear. No. And um, I suppose, you know, now there's a lot of debate and I'm being asked a lot, so what about, you know, is Saudi Arabia going to change towards Shiism and so on? So the main thing would be, well, just say that it's an accepted form of, of, of law. I mean, it would be the most easy thing to do. Um, so far, we haven't seen that and we don't have any uh, Shia scholar on any of the official, you know, scholarly boards. So that's a very easy thing to, to watch out for in the coming, in the coming years um, uh, or decades. So, now, um, I mean, we do see uh, in the last few years a little bit of a change in terms of uh, um, uh, going back to the period under King Abdullah when there was a bit more of a national dialogue and so uh, there is a bit of an inclusion in terms of civil society um, uh, and, and some Shias being, you know, there were meetings um, uh, uh, such as... Uh, such as, you know, this is a meeting earlier, but this is the main, uh, you know, so, I mean, Hassan al-Safar, one of the main Saudi Shia clerics, and this is the, the, the present king. This is an earlier meet, but, but there, there is a bit more visibility uh, uh, again in the last few years after a very tense period um, of the Arab uprisings. But basically, fundamentally, um, I haven't really been able to observe any, any fundamental change such as such as this, I mean, just the recognition of, of, of Shiism as a valid form of Islam. Mind you, the Azhar, the most important Sunni um, uh, Islamic university in the world, arguably, I mean, that's its self-understanding, and if you Google it, I mean, I suppose that's what comes up. But let's say in the Arab world, I mean, it, historically speaking, <laughs> there's uh, uh, a, uh, I mean, very important... <laughs> We can't say it's not an important institution. Accepted Shiism as a valid form of 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 of, of scholarship, you know, of uh, already in the middle of the 20th century, uh, and started teaching it as such, and and teaching it alongside the four um, Sunni madhab. So it is doable. It's it's not something that is impossible because but because of the legacies of of what I just talked about, because of the legacies of both of the Hanbali school and its particular Wahhabi um, interpretation, that will be difficult. But if, of course, you know, Mohammed bin Salman and the, the new kind of Saudi leadership really wants to move away from the Wahhabiyya, I mean, you know, these are the kind of things to watch out for, which would be very serious uh, changes and very real changes. 
So let's come to the third um, theme, I suppose, of today's talk, and that's the relationship, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship with um, uh, Iraq, because the Saudi attitude towards Shiism um, also plays a major role in foreign policy, um, and, and, and you know, some of the instances that I outlined previously where there were very strong, you know, confessional um, issues um, uh, between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq, um, uh, let's see, uh, you know, what the situation is lately, uh, particularly because there's also been some movement. So, in the last few years, Saudi Arabia has reached out to Iraqi Shi figures and has hosted them in Saudi Arabia, a development that was still unimaginable in the 2000s, um, when uh, Iraq uh, didn't have diplomatic, I mean, Saudi Arabia didn't have diplomatic um, uh, uh, relationship uh, uh, with, with Iraq. Um, since the first uh, Gulf War. Um, and um, while it was a frequent demand of both the new Iraqi government and the Americans and, and many others that Saudi Arabia reopen its embassy and, and start you know, normal relations, that, that uh, was, was quite delayed. Um, and um, uh, when I recently um, talked to a number of um, uh, people from the, from the Hausa, you know, the main, main Shia religious uh, institution in, in, um, in Iraq, um, they were, you know, they were quite open in theory about, um, about establishing, well, at least normal relations with Saudi Arabia, despite this, um, this uh, religious uh, kind of, you know, legacy of, of, of quite strong tens tensions. And, um, I mean, if you imagine, you know, uh, not having a relation, diplomatic relationship with, with your neighboring country for more than I mean, 20 years, that's quite, uh, I mean, it's significant in any, in any place of the world. So um, uh, um, it, it has meant that, you know, and, and there was always a bit of a religious element to it in the sense that the Saudis, well, first they, I mean, obviously with, Sa with Saddam, it was not that. It was that, you know, they didn't like that he was threatening to invade uh, Saudi Arabia and, and uh, in general it was not nice to them. But with, after 2003, there was this element that... Um, the Saudis didn't didn't like the new leadership and, and, and didn't like what was going on and didn't want to legitimize it. Um, but now there were even suggestions in the uh, in the media that Saudi Arabia could open a consulate uh, in Najaf um, uh, and, 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 and even of a visit of the Crown Prince to Najaf, which sounded very, um, I mean, you know, given what I just told you and, 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 and people who worked on this for a long time, sounded like a very, I mean, I believe it when I see it, but, but in general it was a very interesting dynamic. I mean, it was something totally unimaginable uh, a longer time ago. When I did a bit of more research into it, um, there's almost no state um, uh, uh, that has a consulate in Najaf. I mean, Najaf being a very important place of pilgrimage, so, so many, millions of people go there uh, every year. Uh, Iran obviously has a consulate there, uh, and Bahrain, interestingly. And um, uh, when I went to the museum of the of the shrine. Um, uh, interestingly, Sheikh Isa, the previous ruler of, uh, of Bahrain, actually visited once, I think in the, uh, um, you know, quite a while ago, um, but obviously no Saudi ruler has ever visited um, uh, 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 Najaf. And um, I mean, apart from the political problems, um, uh, uh, does anyone know why that could be a problem? To, to open, actually. No, to, to, to visit for, for a Saudi ruler. Security. Security is, yeah. of course, one thing, but, but, um, but otherwise also. For the message at home. What? For the message that it will deliver at home. Well, I mean, in theory, we, we would think it should be a nice message. I mean, if it's all about, like, what we just read, I mean, everything is nice. We don't know what the Wahhabiya is. There are all these different Muslims. But what could be a problem when, when, when he actually arrives there? Well, I mean, I mean, I didn't really know that, but once I started looking into it more closely, is that um, there is actually a huge uh, a debate, and there has been a, 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 a quite a significant debate, in, you know, throughout the centuries between Sunni and Shia scholars as to um, uh, uh, where Ali is actually buried, and, uh, and 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 generally in the kind of polemical literature between Sunni Shia and Shia clerics throughout, you know, the last thousand years, Sunni scholars generally tend to say, well, Ali is really not buried where you, where you built this shrine. And in Saudi Arabia, that's the accepted uh, wisdom that, um, uh, uh, um, you know, well, okay, Najaf, the Shia built something, but 
they're worshipping, and in some of the most polemical literature, they're actually worth worshipping a, a, an enemy of the Shia who is allegedly buried there. So, But do you think this is the reason why they... Not no, I'm not saying that's the reason. That's not the reason. The reason is political, but uh, just imagine, I mean, he would go, I mean, yeah. So if Ali is not buried there, no harm done? <laughs> well, that is, of course, no harm done, but, but of course, I mean, so, so it is one of the things where I suppose, <laughs> you know, the, the religious and the polemics and the, the contemporary uh, political uh, uh, issues uh, overlap, and, and, and I want to, you know, go into that uh, a little bit now in the conclusion. I don't think that's the reason why he's not visiting, but, but um, it would actually, um, you know, send a strong message, I suppose, of, of recognition, and... Um, given that there is even disagreement about, about something like this, um, and Ali obviously being, uh, you know, I mean, being one of the four Rashidun caliphs of the Sunnis, obviously very accepted and worshipped and cherished by, by also many Saudis, they just say, well, he's not there. So um, that's a significant, it's a significant thing. Yep. Uh, yeah, the, the Iraqi um, Saudi rapprochement lately is related like closely to to like uh, Iran's foreign policy in the Middle East, and uh, and what will add like I, I'm I'm kind of like um, doing my research on Iran's foreign policy okay. in the Middle East, and it it came up like this Iraqi Saudi rapprochement, but till now I don't see it like uh, so far clear how it will like. Help Saudi Arabia to strengthen their like power in the Middle East, especially that the division in Iraq and uh, and like Shiite the Shiite alliance to Iran and all of this. Well, it's just given what I just outlined, right, uh, and the historical role of Wahhabism in, in 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 first of all in the polemics and then in the actual, you know maltreatment of, of both Shia populations and, and really, you know, destruction of, of Shia holy sites, there is a problem for Saudi Arabia in terms of its relationships with, with uh, Shia populations and, 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 and states that are, you know, have Shia political parties in them, if, in particular if these parties do not like in the, you know, in, in the tw middle of the 20th century define themselves as, as secular leftists or, or something like that, but as Shia identity politics, you know, Islamically defined political parties, there is a, a problem inherent in that relationship. And given that Saudi Arabia didn't have diplomatic relations with Iraq or, or, or very bad ones, um, the recent uh, uh, reaching out is a is a fun, is a change. And uh, why? I mean, I think it's a relatively smart move on the part of the of the Saudis because I mean, given that they didn't have any relationship with Iraq, um, uh, of course Iraq, uh, uh, and Iraq is going through such a difficult period, of course Iraq was going to be closer uh, to Iran. I mean, if to the other side, you know, it's just blocked. Um, uh, and, and many people, I think, are saying it's more natural to have relations um, with everyone. And, um, and, 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 you know, uh, Iraq is, is obviously in need of investment and, and, and a lot of things. And so in that sense that, um, and of course it is to counterbalance uh, Iran, but that is a kind of, it's a truism. I mean, I think what's interesting is that there is a little bit of a change on the discursive level. And, um, you know, the fact that some of these Iraqi Shia leaders really did go to to Saudi Arabia, I mean, including Muqtada um, Sadr. Uh, um, I mean, just imagine this 10 years ago. It would be really, uh, uh, I mean, these are quite, uh, on the symbolic level, quite symbolic. We went 10 years ago. Also. Okay. Okay. I have this one. Thank you for correcting me. Of course, I mean, inside Saudi Arabia at the time of this last year, at the time of this visit, there was just a, a, a severe crackdown on Awamiya, a village in the eastern province where there is still some Shia, you know, political mobilization going on. So some of those people thought that that's now, what is going on now? You know, now we have these Iraqi Shia leaders coming to visit our country while, while you know, this, this place is being destroyed. But, um, um, Anyway, um, I, I just want to give you a bit of an overview of why I think I, you know, I, I told you this story and how it kind of relates more broadly to, to the question of uh, confessional identities um, and, and um, uh, the broader debates um, about it. Um, because I focus on this topic in today's talk, not only because it is of very, you know, of enormous importance to the history of Islam in the last two and a half centuries, 
to the history of the Arabian Peninsula and Sunni-Shia relations in particular, but also because it is a good case study to try and answer some broader questions about the notion of sectarianism. There is first of all a battle over definitions uh, going on amongst scholars on the issue and amongst people living in societies with confessional differences. Ta'ifiya, the Arabic equivalent, is a term one accuses others with, something one identifies against. Recently, um, I saw on the streets of Iraq a campaign by President Haider al-Abadi that outlined a few steps that needed to be taken to establish a prosperous future of Iraq, so posters everywhere. And one of those steps, I think there were four, um, was to overcome sectarianism. So, la lilta ifia. And then afterwards, everything will be fine. Um, anyway, if we take the definition that confessional identities take on a political dimension and become the or one of the main identifiers of a group of people, that can be sufficient, I think, for now as a working definition. But the story I focused on today has proven so influential and inflammatory in Sunni-Shi relations because it combines a number of causes that in the literature are often debated separately. While almost no one in academia still takes a primordialist angle, this is still popular in popular discourse and the media and even amongst decision makers, both in the Middle East and uh, outside. So, while Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was disappointed with the state of the Islamic world, his main focus was the doctrine and in particular the ritual practice of Muslims, and not their relationship with Europe, for example. Unlike the Salafi reformers of the late 19th and early 20th century in Egypt and other places, who appropriated some of his ideas, and some of the ideas on which he was basing his ideas, he was not writing his treatises in the face of European colonial encroachment and power. Instead, he was trained in the local Hanbali tradition, came into contact with Indian scholars that emphasized the importance of the authenticity of Hadith, and encountered Shias and Sufis on his travels around the Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf. And somewhere along those journeys, he decided it was his mis mission to wage a war on practices and beliefs that he deemed to be un-Islamic. It is difficult to imagine that he would have succeeded in establishing such an important movement if he could not base himself on intellectual predecessors, in particular on one branch of the Hanbali movement, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim in particular. For they had already compiled long treatises on the subjects that Ibn Abdul Wahhab would write on, and he would quote them at large, and their books are much more substantial. While they were controversial scholars in their own right, they had, they had identified in particular Shi'is as being one of the main problems afflicting Islam. So Wahhabi anti-Shi'ism has an intellectual genealogy that goes back to the 13th and to earlier centuries. The availability of those ideas, in manuscript form not least, and the level of detail of this earlier Sunni Shia polemic, in particular one between Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, Al-Hilli, which he quoted from a lot, allowed uh, the Sheikh um, Ibn Abdul Wahhab to appropriate these ideas and make them a core tenet of his movement and relatively consistent um, within themselves. But as we have seen earlier, without the backing of a local ruler, Ibn Abdul Wahhab could easily have remained a very peripheral figure. He was expelled from a number of places, including his hometown, and ostracized by his own family. He might even have been killed, as some of his enemies demanded. But the backing of the Al Saud family gave his ideas, you know, the backing of a modern, of a, of a pre-modern state power. Obviously, still fairly limited, but it would eventually transform into a modern state. It is thus a classical case of the coupling of religion and politics, of ideas with material power. One would not work without the other. It is not a primordial story, but neither is it one of simply instrumentalizing religion and ideas. It is the interplay between the two that turned Ibn Abdul Wahhab from an ostracized man into the spiritual leader of a major political and religious force. And the later development of the movement is also related to imperialism, another variable that is often wholeheartedly blamed for the rise of sectarianism. Imperialism in this context first of all meant the Ottoman Empire, and it was against the Ottomans that he rebelled first and foremost, going as far as declaring them unbelievers. 
And it were the Ottomans that fought against the Wahhabis most viciously throughout the 19th century in particular. They saw this movement as a threat, in particular if they captured Mecca and Medina, which they briefly did, uh, a threat to the position of the Sultan as Caliph, so as an ideational and political threat. And it were inter-imperial rivalries that would eventually allow the Saudi Wahhabi forces to conquer the territory of modern Saudi Arabia. For the British saw in the Wahhabis an ally against the Ottomans, and despite all the knowledge they had about what you know, the Wahhabi beliefs were about, and the British were writing the first kind of longer reports um, on the Wahhabis. The fact that the main rivals of the Al Saud in, in Najd, the Al Rashid and in Ha'il, were Ottoman allies, would eventually seal the fate of those Al Rashid. It was with World War I approaching and the Ottoman Empire weakening that they conquered the East and after the war, World War I, and the abolishing of the Caliphate, the Hijaz. Thereby, the emerging Saudi polity received international attention and legitimacy and would also receive a British stipend until oil would start to be exported in significant quantities in the mid-20th century by um, American oil companies. In the context of the Cold War, Wahhabism and Islam in general was seen as a major asset against communism, and the Americans thus encouraged the Islamizing policies of the Saudi state and its uh, religious institutions. And after 1979, this weapon was unleashed simultaneously against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan and, and other places, and against Shi Iran. The enormous potency of the, of the ideas that Ibn Abdul Wahhab had put into practice would prove doubly useful. After 1990, the anti-communist element was obviously much less important, as people here will know, and de-emphasized. The anti-Shia element, on the other hand, remained constant. The history of Sunni-Shi relations is thus one in which the debates about doctrine, the basis of jurisprudence and the early history are relevant, but they are so particularly when they become used and abused in political struggles in particular when charismatic, charismatic leaders, coupled with state power, or leaders of militant movements with a willingness to use violence against another confessional group, use religion as an ideological weapon. That the imperial context is key is a truism. But the last few days have just shown us again how important the role of global powers in undermining stability in the Middle East is and what impact they can have on confessional relations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matthewson. Uh, it was really a